Mr. Charles Stevenson, an enlisted soldier in the First World War and prominent businessman with Hallmark in Kansas City, conceived the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame. It was established in 1969 by the Henry Leavenworth Chapter of AUSA and the Fort Leavenworth Command to honor outstanding military and civilian leaders of the Armed Forces of the United States who have served at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas and made a significant contribution to the achievement, tradition, or history of Fort Leavenworth and the Armed Forces of the United States. Eligibility for the Hall of Fame is extended to military and civilian personnel of all ranks and grades of the Armed Forces of the United States who have been stationed at or assigned as a student at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Nominees must have made a significant contribution to Fort Leavenworth and the Armed Forces in the realm of caring for soldiers, special achievement, tradition, or history. The nominating committee includes historians from various universities, general officers, and prominent business leaders. They convene annually to review nominations and investigate their careers to ensure that they meet the rigorous criteria. They forward their recommendations to the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors then vote on the nominations, selecting two for induction that year. Some of the most notable inductees are Meriwether Lewis and William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, whom you can find right outside the auditorium doors in the atrium. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the entrance of the official party and remain standing for the national anthem and an invocation given by the Command and General Staff College Chaplain, Chaplain Sean Gee. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we seek your blessing upon today's ceremony and everyone attending. We especially give thanks for Major General Retired William Giles Harding Carter and Brigadier General Retired Huba Vas de Sega's faithful service to their country during times of both peace and war. We recognize and are humbled by the fact that we stand upon the shoulders of leaders like them leaders that have gone before us to model courage under fire, wisdom to shape the force, and consummate professionalism. As we reflect today upon their contributions and service, may we be inspired to be better leaders for our nation's sons and daughters. In your holy name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Today, we are honoring the latest inductees into the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame. They are Major General Retired William Giles Harding Carter and Brigadier General Retired Huba Vastasega. Both inductees were elected by the Board of Governors of the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame in January of this year. The official party for today's Hall of Fame induction ceremony includes 
starting at your right is Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy, Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center and Fort Leavenworth. To his right is Command Sergeant Major David O. Turnbull, Command Sergeant Major of the Combined Arms Center and Fort Leavenworth. To his right, accepting on behalf of the late Major General William Giles Harding Carter, is his great-grandson, Mr. William H. Harding. And to his right is Brigadier General Huba Vas de Sega, U.S. Army retired, former Assistant Division Commander of the 1st Infantry Division, Fort Riley, Kansas, and the first director of the School of Advanced Military Studies, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And our award presenter for this ceremony is Corporal Thomas Noel, United States Marine Corps. Please allow me to recognize our special guests in attendance today. We have Mayor Frank Offutt, Mayor of Platte City, Lieutenant General Robert Arter, U.S. Army retired, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army for Kansas and Mrs. Arter, Lieutenant General Richard Keller, U.S. Army retired, Ambassador David Lambertson, former ambassador to Tyreland, Mr. Charles Rainey, the City Commissioner of Leavenworth, Kansas, Colonel Roger Donlin, U.S. Army retired, Medal of Honor recipient, Mrs. Michael Lundy, spouse of Commanding General, the Combined Arms Center, Mrs. Sherry Patrick, spouse of Brigadier General Vastasega, First Lieutenant Margaret Pierce, daughter of Brigadier General Vastasega, First Lieutenant Jackson Pierce, son-in-law Br to Brigadier General Vastasega, and Mr. Matthew Vastasega, son of Brigadier General Vastasega. General officers, members of the senior executive staff, community leaders, Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame members, welcome to all of you and thank you for being here today. It is now my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Commanding General of Combined Arms Center, Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy. Well, first, thank you all for being here today on this very special occasion. You know, as we think back in history and, and informs where we are today, I think you can't look at two greater symbols um, in people and soldiers and leaders that have shaped where we're at today as an army and here at Fort Leavenworth. So it's truly my honor today for us to be able to recognize these two great leaders. And first, as we think about Major General Retired Carter, the impact that he had on our army, we're talking about a cavalryman, a cavalryman who served across the frontier of our nation as the frontier of our nation was opening up, who demonstrated extraordinary bravery, earning the Medal of Honor. But that was not his true um, great thing that he did. He was an intellectual, and he understood that to professionalize an army was very important. And that professionalism only came through education, learning, and reflection. And so he became a very influential member and, and, and person in our history by driving our entire professional military education program. And really, if you think about why we're here today, I would tell you that General Carter was that seed that was planted and what he drove for us uh, today in our current professional military education. He exemplified everything about the Army profession, his character, his commitment, and certainly his competence. So today we're very honored to be able to recognize him. We're very honored to have his great grandson here to receive that recognition. So today I hereby proclaim the induction of Major General William Giles Harding Carter into the Hall of Fame. Please publish the citation. Born in Nashville, Tennessee in 1851, William Giles Harding Carter was educated at the Kentucky Military Institute. As a youth, he served as a messenger during the Civil War. In 1873, he graduated from the United States Military Academy and was assigned to the 8th Infantry, but subsequently transferred to the 6th Cavalry Regiment and participated in many actions and campaigns against hostile Native Americans. In 1881, he received the Medal of Honor for Heroism in Action against the Apache at the Battle of Sibiku Creek in the Arizona Territory. In 1893, Carter arrived at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. While commanding his company, he concurrently served as an assistant instructor in the Cavalry Department of the Infantry and Cavalry School. During this period, he published Horses, Saddles, and Bridles, a significant work that increased the prestige of the school. He also became the editor of the Journal of the United States Cavalry Association. During this period, Carter also became an advocate of reform in Army education. In the Infantry and Cavalry School at Fort Leavenworth, he argued that the theory should go hand in hand with practical application 
in officer education and also advocated the introduction of a capstone course consisting of a large field exercise. After departing Fort Leavenworth in 1897, Carter continued his quest for Army reform. As a close advisor to the Secretary of War, Elihu Root, Carter was instrumental in bringing a general staff system to the Army in 1903, which replaced the ineffective Bureau system. Additionally, Carter urged an education system for the Army that would provide well-trained officers for general staff positions, and he pushed for the creation of a war college to better prepare senior officers. These ideas largely came to fruition in 1901 with General Order No. 155, which established a hierarchy of Army schools that began with elementary topics at post schools, progressed to special service schools, then recognized the General Service and Staff College at Fort Leavenworth and culminating with the war Army War College. General Order No. 155 also tied progression through this educational system to continued promotion, vastly increasing the Army's professionalization. After serving as Commanding General of the Hawaiian Department, he retired from Army, uh, the Army on November 19, 1915, but was recalled to active duty in 1917. During this period, he commanded the Central Department in Chicago, Illinois, until his second retirement in February 1918. Carter was the last officer on active duty with Civil War service. He died on May 24, 1925, in Washington, D.C., and was buried in the Arlington National Cemetery. Service at Fort Leavenworth. Lieutenant General Carter was an instructor at the Command and General Staff College from 1893 to 1897. Lieutenant General Lundy and Mr. Carter will now unveil the shadow box that will be mounted in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Lieutenant General Lundy and Command Sergeant Major Turnbull will now present a memento from the CAC commander commemorating this event to Mr. Carter on behalf of Fort Leavenworth and the Combined Arms Center. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking on behalf of the late Major General William H. Harding Carter, his great-grandson, Mr. William H. Carter. Thank you very much. Well, I am, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm representing my family, and I have a 92-year-old a father who desperately wishes he could be here to uh, be part of this, but is unable to travel. Uh, and I have promised him uh, videotapes, films, uh, to bring home with me. Um, I think it's a, 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 a tribute, uh, certainly, to our family. Uh, I can't pretend to be an expert you know, in military history, but I appreciate the fact that he had a substantial impact on the Army, and we are uh, uh, very thankful for this recognition uh, and being part of this institution on an ongoing basis. I thought I would remark uh, uh, not so much on uh, the Army itself in that I'm, I'm not an expert, but I can certainly talk about the impact the Army's had on my family uh, and the impact uh, General Carter has had on our family. Uh, he died in 1925, as was mentioned. Uh, my father was born in 1925, so he'd never actually met his grandfather. Uh, but General Carter's wife, uh, Ida, who he married in the 1880s, uh, lived until the late 1950s. And so she, uh, and lived with the family, and uh, told many stories of the days on the frontier uh, with, uh, you know, Indian skirmishes and, and uh, life, uh, which was, from everything I've heard, incredibly difficult uh, in those days. And that kept many of the stories alive of General Carter and uh, the different assignments he had, the different postings he had, uh, and some of the things he did. As we think about our family, uh, he had two sons, uh, one Lee Carter, who my father's named after, who actually died uh, relatively young in a university uh, a laboratory accident. But he had another son, William Vaux Carter, uh, who also attended West Point and graduated in 1904, uh, and actually served uh, for his father at one point in the Philippines, uh, but remained in the Army and retired as a general officer in the 40s. 
Uh, William Vox Carter had four sons, uh, my father being one of them, and uh, all four sons joined the U.S. Army. Uh, two of them attended West Point and were career either Army officers or one became a career CIA officer. Uh, and the other two sons were Army flyers but went on to uh, careers in business. So we certainly, uh, when I was young, uh, talked about the Army a lot and I had uncles who were very involved. Interestingly, my mother and my father and mother got married in the late 40s uh, and were childhood sweethearts. Uh, her father uh, was a general in the Army and actually was at West Point uh, just shortly before W.H. Carter and he retired in the, in the 20s. And she had two brothers at West Point when my father's brothers were there. So we had lots of, uh, as a child, I remember lots of stories about West Point and the Army uh, and the impact it had on our family. And needless to say, it was very good to our family. In, in terms of uh, development of, of, of great people. Uh, and that's my firm belief, certainly everything I know is the Army does develop great people. Um, as I think about uh, kind of moving forward, I am embarrassed to say, especially in light of all the uniforms I'm staring at, that Army service did not continue in my generation or my children's generation. Uh, so although we had uh, a significant presence at one point, uh, we, we all, uh, I did not serve in the armed forces. Uh, but I like to think that um, we inherited from W.H. Carter and the legacy he left continues in the family uh, for several different things. I think first of all, in all the reading I've done and talking to my father, uh, he had a tremendous amount of intellectual curiosity, which I think has continued in our family. And in all the writings he did, he was continually questioning how things worked, why things worked. Uh, he was a voracious reader, uh, and he also was an author. Um, I think, secondly, he was an opinionated man. Um, and that can be taken in two ways, uh, but I, I say that in the sense that uh, he was someone who had deep conviction of his beliefs and his opinions. Uh, he expressed those, and there's a fair amount of correspondence uh, and meetings he had uh, with Elijah Root and others. Uh, and I, I like to think that some of those attributes continue. Um, I'm a firm believer it's good to have opinions uh, and to express those opinions. And thirdly, he was a, uh, a very loyal and devoted individual with 50 years of service in the Army, uh, as well as very devoted to his family. Um, so I like to think he has left us a legacy in our later generations uh, in looking at the pictures of him, I realized the other legacy he had is he and I share the same hairline. Uh, but uh, I hadn't fully appreciated that until, uh, until I saw these pictures. Um, so with that, I wanted uh, again to thank, uh, uh, thank General Lundy and certainly um, the committee uh, for selecting my great-grandfather. It is a huge uh, tribute to our family and we do not take this lightly. Um, and I will certainly talk to my other family members and describe to them uh, today's activities and take back the, uh, the, the memento plaque. Uh, and lastly, being a civilian, I couldn't uh, sit down without thanking all of you for your service to our country. Uh, you know, we, I'm not sure that is said often enough, but it is deeply appreciated. And uh, I appreciate the ability to come here today and be able to say that. So that concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Once again, Lieutenant General Michael Lundy. I think you're going to find a, a common theme, and there is a, there is a bit of common ground between our two selectees today. I, I agree, they, they both are opinionated. <laughs> oh, and they're great, great opinions. They both served on the frontier and demonstrated extraordinary valor. And when you look at General Wastasega's time in Vietnam as an advisor to an indigenous ranger force there, and the challenges that they met, he certainly served on his own frontier, earning the Silver Star. So again, there's a common nexus. He's also a prolific writer. Um, and not only when he was in service and in uniform, but he's a prolific writer today, and he writes about the profession and war fighting. And I would tell you that uh, his writings are more relevant or as relevant or even more relevant today than they were uh, in 1982. But he's probably best known for really writing our foundational doctrine, a doctrine that still 
lives today, although it's slightly morphed, slightly changed, some of the names have changed, the foundation of our land battle uh, are still the, the underpinnings of our current doctrine of unified land operations and certainly of our own joint doctrine as well because it did have a heavy influence on where we went from a joint doctrine perspective. General Wasasega was also um, on common ground with General Carter because he, was, he believed in education and the value of professional military education, the importance of it, and as the first director of SAMS, um, to be able to see where that program is today that he started uh, definitely demonstrates uh, his belief in how we build competent and committed and leaders of character uh, through our professional military education. So certainly we have uh, very common ground as we've looked at these two uh, phenomenal leaders that have made such a great impact on not only our Army but across our entire joint force and frankly many of our multinational partners uh, as you look out as our doctrine and, and education has proliferated throughout the world. So again, it's uh, truly my honor to proclaim the induction of Brigadier General Retired Hubo Asta Sega. Please remain seated as I read the citation. Born in Hungary in 1941, Hubo Vasta Sega escaped to Western Germany just as the Soviet armies approached. Immigrating to the United States in 1951, he graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1964 and was commissioned an infantry officer. Vasta Sega served as a platoon leader in the 8th Infantry Division and in January 1967, he deployed to Vietnam, where he became a battalion senior advisor for a Vietnamese Ranger Battalion. He returned to Vietnam in 1968 and assumed command of Company A, 3rd Battalion, 503rd Parachute Infantry, 173rd Airborne Brigade. After returning from Vietnam, Vas de Sega graduated from the Infantry Officer Advance Course in 1970 before studying economics and international relations at Harvard. He graduated from the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas in 1976. Over the next four years, he served a series of assignments in the 9th Infantry Division, including Commander of the 2nd Battalion, 60th Infantry. In 1977, he participated in the Army Chief of Staff's Review of Education and Training of Officers. Returning to Fort Leavenworth, Vastasega served as a Doctrine Author and Chief of the Doctrine Section. In this assignment, he was the principal author of a new capstone manual for the Army, the 1982 edition of FM 100-5, Air Land Battle. While drafting it, he recommended selected officers attend a second, advanced year of study to Lieutenant General Richardson. In 1982, he became an Army War College Fellow at Fort Leavenworth, and in 1983, became the first director of the School of Advanced Military Studies. Vastasega also led the efforts to update FM 100-5 Airland Operations. From 1985 to 1988, he commanded the 9th Infantry Regiment at Fort Ord, California. Promoted to Brigadier General, over the next three years, his team formulated and implemented the Cold War Ending Treaty on Military Forces for the NATO Supreme Allied Commander and the NATO Secretary General. In his final assignment, Vastasega served as the Assistant Division Commander for the 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley, Kansas, and retired from active service in 1993. After retirement from the Army in 1993, Vasta retained his role as an influential military thinker and was heavily involved in Army studies of its future role. He also wrote numerous articles on leadership, officer education, managing institutional change, and doctrine. Brigadier General Vasta awards and decorations include the Distinguished Service Medal, the Silver Star, the Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, and the Bronze Star with two V devices and four oak leaf clusters. His service at Fort Leavenworth includes Student, Command and General Staff College, 1975 to 1976, Author and Chief of Doctrine Section, 1980 through 1982, and Director, Advanced Military Studies Program, 1983 through 1985.
Lieutenant General Lundy and Brigadier General Vastasega now unveil the shadow box that will be mounted in the Hall of Fame. Lieutenant General Lundy and Command Sergeant Major Turnbull will now present a memento from the CAC commander commemorating this event to Brigadier General Vostasega on behalf of Fort Leavenworth and the Combined Arms Center. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Vostasega. Well, thank you to the committee, and thank you for all of you great folks here, here today, and my family from far away, and those of you who could be in class, and uh, our honored guests today. I just want to say that uh, the doctrinal reforms between 1980 in 86, and the formation of the School of, of Advanced Military Studies were not the accomplishment of one individual. I was lucky to be here at Fort Leavenworth, and I was lucky to serve with capable professionals and under very supportive bo uh, bosses. And also, I was lucky to get away with a little bit of heresy now and then. The lesson here is that there are far fewer innovators than there are innovative thinkers. A new idea must truly fit a need. Bosses must support it. The normal processes of the institution must not be allowed to foil it. I learned this early. The year was 1965. I was in Germany we lived 48 hours from World War III. The times were serious. My platoon had these four hefty 50 caliber machine guns that we depended on to fix the enemy in place while we dismounted and maneuvered around their flank to get a drop on them. To get the accuracy we needed, we dismounted these guns and we put them on a, on the, uh, on a tripod with a mechanism called the T and E mechanism that many of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it really allows you to be very accurate. This method cost time and effort. The carrier top mount didn't have a way to employ such a device, so when you fired from there, you scattered your fire, and what that meant was that you couldn't keep the fire on the enemy long enough for you to sneak up on them while they kept their heads down. Um, we needed an innovation. My idea was for platoon sergeant Mullis to make a bolt-on bracket for the carrier gun mount at the maintenance welding shop. This was easy, cost about $10. The labor was free, sort of, bottle of scotch. The contraption was easy to mount and dismount and work like a charm. Now the idea needed to be sanctioned for local manufacture and the broader dissemination. The next time we were scheduled for a 50 caliber range, uh, Platoon Sergeant Mullis demonstrated the contraption to the company commander, who immediately wanted to have us demonstrate the idea to the battalion commander. The battalion commander saw Platoon Sergeant Mullis tear the center out of a panel placed on a far hill and decided to bring around the commanding general that very afternoon. The general was impressed and told me to submit the platoon's invention to Fort Benning for army-wide adoption. Much pleased with ourselves, we did. After the general left, the division command sergeant major asked us whose idea this was. Platoon Sergeant Mullis told him it was mine. The grizzled Korean War veteran then looked me up and down and said, Lieutenant, you'll go far as long as you max the PT test 
and get your hands dirty in the motor pool. Of course, he was right. And this is the advice I gave every SAMS graduate the two years that I was there. There's a further lesson to this story. About six months after I submitted the contraption to Fort Benning, I received a response. It said, thank you for your suggestion, but there's no need for that now. A replacement of the M113 personnel carrier is in the works. It's called the McV, which later became the Bradley. It can fire accurately in the mounted support by fire roll. And with, with this, we were satisfied, of course. But we had already practiced some heresy by illegally making this contraption for our own company, and other companies followed suit. Thirteen years later, I was privileged to command a battalion of mechanized infantry still mounted in the venerable M113 personnel carrier. <laughs> And no one had heard of a $10 contraption to enable accurate 50 caliber fire from the top of the M113. What's the lesson? Even though you have an idea that is self-evidently sound and truly fits the need, don't just drop it into the officially designated suggestion box, because a well-intentioned bureaucracy can foil its adoption. A little heresy now and then can be a good thing. In 1980, I left that battalion to come to Fort Leavenworth. I had written a sharp critique of the Army's active, duty, uh, active defense uh, doctrine while a member of CGSC class of 1976, saying in essence that the doctrine confused firepower, the effect of guns and missiles, with combat power, the power to actually decide the battle. Too long to be a military review article, I was long-winded even then. It was, dis it was disseminated by duplication around the Army, an alternative to dropping things into the doctrine suggestion box, of course. A copy came across the desk of then Lieutenant General William Richardson, the Commandant at CGSC, he soon had me at work revising the 1976 doctrine that I critiqued. Major promotable Leonard D. Don Holder, the recent S3 of the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment patrolling the border in Germany, soon joined me. In a decision that surprised me, General Richardson arranged to shortcut the normal bureaucratic drafting process. As we drafted chapters, they were distribu distributed directly to four people at once, my four bosses, From up to General Don Starry, the commander of TRADOC, General Richardson, of course, uh, the commandant, deputy commandant of the school, uh, Brigadier General Robert Foreman, and Colonel Clyde Tate an unheard of, unbureaucratic procedure. This decision set up a cycle of drafting and redrafting chapter by chapter until we had a complete body of work. Don Holder and I leapfrogged drafting chapters. We read and commented on each other's work, cycled our work to the four bosses, worked on the next chapter while waiting on the comments from the bosses. Some of this time we went on reverse cycle so as not to be disturbed. The bosses read and commented on our work as they received it and made their comments in the margins. These returned to us directly in the, in the production of the version, uh, of the next version, they allowed us, listen to this, they allowed us to sort out their comments as we chose and allowed us to put it into the words that we saw most fit. And it boldened us to challenge unsortable, unsupportable assertions that people were making and stimulated our thinking. We had occasional meetings to sort out issues up and down. The drafts got better. Drafts per periodically went out to Army-wide staffing and also to the 
uh, Army's outside critics, whom before we were doing this to. The first version of Air Land Battle Doctrine was published in 1982. At this juncture, we took another unbureaucratic decision. I asked permission to begin another revision immediately because there were some elements of the doctrine we had not developed well enough, and we were sure the field was going to come back with some suggestions as well, especially the concepts of operational art. And I asked to take the task with me to the new School of Advanced Military Studies I plan to start next. In the fall of 1981, Lieutenant General William Richardson ordered the directors of CGSC to find ways to, quote, improve tactical judgment of the CGSC graduate. The Commandant asked me to participate in this committee effort. By this time, I was at the center of the effort to revise the doctrine of the way the Army should think about waging war with the Soviet Union. Now, I just come from battalion command. This was a leap. Um, I felt inadequate. I noticed that others around me, even senior war college graduates, were not any better equipped to think critically, incredibly creatively about the military art. We had learned the doctrine of the day, but not how to usefully judge it, question it, or revise it. The military art of our time was more intellectually demanding than we had been prepared to accept. And in your day, it's even more so. The committee of directors came forward with a number of remedies. Their suggestions, they suggested improvements which were helpful, but inadequate to bridge the chasm that I saw between what was and what needed to be. General Richardson had addressed the right question, but the Army needed a genuine paradigm shift to solve it. The directors naturally saw their charter making improvements within the existing paradigm, and they did. My ideas went beyond improvements to, uh, to the paradigm, so I did not push my ideas, my dissenting case at the time. Instead, I developed a detailed, detailed the ideas and developed a curriculum and figured out how to start and build such a school and, and waited for an opportunity. In having worked with General Richardson closely on the Army, I knew that if I had a chance to talk to him for a while, he would give me a fair hearing. In the late spring of 1982, General Richardson invited me to accompany him on a 21-day to China to visit the Chinese military school system. We were the first Americans to have that insight. This trip was uh, a historic occasion. On a Yangtze River cruise, a short break between school visits, I finally had an opportunity to discuss my ideas. I suggested that, that the Army needed to select a small portion of each CGSE class, put them through a 10-month graduate level uh, education in how to think about military art. My discussion with General Richardson lasted no more than an hour. Within that space, key ideas took shape that gave SAMS its distinct character. The groundwork for the school was done during the fall of 1982, and in the early months of, of 1983, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Winton and Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Johnson and I became the, quote, SAMS curriculum carpentry team. Uh, those two guys were brilliant. Uh, by June that year, the first class met and began to, the, their journey of learning. Uh, in the June of, of, of 84, the, the, they, they graduated, and the next class arrived, and it was twice as large as the first one. This was how uh, was when my uh, fellow Airland Battle 82 writer, Don Holder, came back and began the revision of the 82 manual. At the end of the school year, Don Holder departed to be the G3 of a division. I, I took on the doctrine project myself 
hand, handing the di directorship off to Colonel Rick Sinreich, who succeeded me. In 82, there was no Army or Joint School curriculum that addressed the military art of campaigning in any, any adequate depth. By the fall of 85, I departed Fort Leavenworth for brigade command, having produced two classes who could do that. Nearly one half of these students commanded brigades later, and about one third became general officers. And soon after that, uh, after I left, the matured version of 1986 of Air Land Battle was published under General or Colonel Rick Sinbright's direction. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Uh, the point is that institutional can change within the Army can come from the bottom up. A new idea must be truly fit and need. The normal processes, as I said before, must not be allowed to foil it. Bosses must be found and convinced to support it. And surprisingly, the higher up you go to find support, the more likely you are to find an innovator. Remember that. And yes, it helps to max the PT test and to get your hands dirty in the motor pool. And now and then it's useful to be a heretic. And thank you very much for listening and thank you all for coming. Cool. And thank you to the committee. And Thank you, Brigadier General Vastasega. Please rise for the Army song and remain standing for the departure of the official party. There is a receiving line in the atrium. We ask our distinguished guests to please use the exit to your left front and follow the commander in chief's hallway to the atrium. The reception will begin shortly thereafter. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you all for attending.